Genetics is astonishing evidence of a designer who created a marvelously complex, efficient information system for encoding life. The complexity of DNA is problematic for molecules to man evolution, since the necessary changes are so implausible. The only reasonable explanation for all the information in DNA is that a designer put the information in the original DNA sequences. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, Design in DNA with Dr. Georgia Purdom. Hello and welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science, along with other important facts validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Dr. Georgia Purdom, received a PhD in molecular genetics from The Ohio State University. She has won a variety of honors and been a professor of biology. Dr. Purdom has also published research papers in both secular and creation peer-reviewed technical journals. She now serves as ministry content administrator, speaker, author, and researcher for Answers in Genesis in Kentucky. Wow, great to have you on the show, Dr. Purdom. Great to be here. We're talking about design in DNA today. Can you tell us what we're going to be looking at? Well, this is one of my favorite topics um, to discuss as a geneticist, just looking at the amazing complexity of DNA. Because really, I always say the more we know, the less we know, or mm. the more we know, the more we know we need to know. Mm, okay. <laughs> uh, because it is so complex. And really what we're gonna be doing today is just kind of flying at 30,000 feet. And um, we're gonna be looking at some of the details, but um, I always like people to know there's so many more mm. um, because it just is really um, that complex. Mm. Oh, wow, and DNA again is something that is in every living organism, in every cell, right? Right, right, and we're gonna be mainly focusing on human DNA today okay. because obviously that's most important to us um, mm -hmm. and what's going on there. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, some of the basic facts about the human genome. Uh, we have three billion base pairs in our DNA. That equates to about six feet of DNA in every cell, if you were to unwind it wow. and stretch it out. So it's a lot of DNA. Mm. Um, and it's a twisted double helix. So it's kind of like a ladder that's mm -hmm. been, just kind of been twisted around. And there, there's really two strands of bases. We abbreviate those A, C, T, and G that pair with each other. So you can see it here. So there's rules that are followed with DNA, but A always binds to T, and then um, C always binds to G, okay? And okay. so, it, you know, if you were to untwist it, it would just look like a ladder, basically, mm. but it's a twisted double helix is what it's really referred to as. So we really want to talk about, in order to help people understand a little bit um, better about this, it's organized into um, 23 pairs of chromosomes in human beings, and we have about 20,000 genes, okay? Now, genes are the instructions for proteins, but that's only about 2% of our DNA. Hmm. Um, it's not really that much. Now, the other 98% is considered junk, and we're gonna talk about how it's really not junk, it's really important, it's functional, and it's doing something. So even though they call it this, as we're gonna see, we need a brand new name, okay? Because okay. that's just not, because again, DNA is designed, so mm -hmm. there is an amazing amount of complexity there. So the central dogma, what we call, of molecular biology, which is my specialty, is that DNA, which is the kind of like a library, basically inside of our cells, it is transcribed into something called RNA. RNA is kind of like an intermediate. It's like making a Xerox copy of a book, so to speak. Mm. And then that's translated into proteins. Okay? And proteins, that's what makes us up, right? Mm. Structurally, functionally. Um, yes, we have some fat. Yes, we have some sugars and some uh, DNA, RNA. But mostly we're proteins. Mm. Um, that's what our bodies are composed of. And so these processes of um, transcription and translation, we could spend whole shows just talking about those. Mm. I mean, they in and of themselves are very, very complex. Um, but 
you have to remember that there's, like I said, six feet of DNA in every cell. But yet you want a liver cell to be different than a brain cell, mm. right? Because liver cells need to produce liver proteins and brain cells need to produce brain proteins. So how do you do that when all of the information is in every cell? How do you get only certain parts of it to be expressed in the individual cells? Mm. And that's where it comes down to regulation. Okay, regulation is really important. So that other 98, you know, this is basically 2% of the DNA, right, that does this. This is what the other 98% is doing. This is why it's important. Because there's so much regulation that's required, um, you need a lot of DNA to do that. And that regulation, we're going to see, really speaks of design. When we're looking at the DNA, that falls under the category of observational science. It's something we can observe and study in the present. Do we look at it starting with God's word and the amazing design and complexity that we see there as a result of God's intelligence? Or do we start with man's word and that what we see, the amazing complexity and so-called design, is a result of evolutionary changes, really just random chance over eons of time. Hmm. And, you know, for evolutionists, um, you know, DNA, I mean, as a geneticist, I'm kind of like, how can you look at this and say it's, it's just random? Mm. It's, you know, it's not design. Mm. And one of the things that evolutionists will say is it's apparently designed. <laughs> it's apparent design. In other mm. words, it looks design, but it really isn't. Mm. Right? We know that. And, and I want to share a quote from Leslie Orgel, um, who's an evolutionist, and um, he said this. He said, it is genuinely surprising that an organism that has evolved by random mutation, right, random mutation and selection, appears to be design. The idea is contrary to intuition. It is true, but to many it will always remain ridiculous. So he's admitting mm -hmm. that it appears, in other words, the evidence right. looks like, and what you would normally conclude is this is designed. Yep. It seems to me their, it's their view that's contrary to intuition. Right. Again, they're not willing to give up their world view, their idea mm. about looking at the past. But what we're going to see as we look at this is that it does confirm and is consistent with God's word. This could have come only about by great intelligence to be able to design this and do this and does not confirm that it's a result of evolutionary changes over time. And this is the evidence. We're looking, again, the scientific right. method, scientific what we can study mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with observation and so right. forth. Absolutely. So we're going to look at two major types of design. There are many, many more, but we're just going to look at two, and that's sequence design and then um, what we call, what I call structural design. So mm -hmm. the first thing we're going to look at is sequence design, and that's the actual sequence of the DNA. Okay, sure. how is it um, designed? I said this before, approximately 98% of human DNA doesn't code for proteins, okay? It doesn't make up who we are as far, from a protein perspective, at mm -hmm. least. So I, throw the, I show the little garbage can, you know, <laughs> in the garbage truck um, with DNA in it because it's that's junk. what they call it. <laughs> um, they call it junk DNA. And there's lots of different types, um, mm. and we're not going to go into all the specifics, but there's what they call non-coding RNAs. Normally go DNA to RNA to protein, but these don't go to proteins, they just stay oh, okay. RNA. Okay. There's repetitive sequences, so DNA says the same thing over and over again. And then there's something called um, pseudogenes as well. So there's a couple mm. different categories of the um, junk DNA that okay. they categorize it. Okay. But again, like I say, if you look at this whole pie chart, if this would be the components of the human genome, only 2% codes for protein, just this little green sliver here, that's it. Wow. Okay, so the rest of it has been called junk. Okay. Now, why? Right? Because this just seems odd to me. From a creation perspective, it seems really odd to me. Mm. Um, but they would say these are genetic fossils or leftovers from our evolutionary past. So just like you dig up organisms that are no longer around, that they say are transitions, right, between one thing to mm -hmm. another, they say you can see evidence of that in our DNA, that there's mm. fossils there, like from when we were a fish and had fins, or when mm -hmm. we were a chimpanzee and had a tail. Mm -hmm. um, they're no longer used. We know we've evolved beyond that, but there's still remnants of it kind of in our DNA. Mm. Okay? That's the idea. That's what they thought all this other DNA was. Okay. It's just leftovers from our evolutionary past mm. that we haven't gotten rid of quite yet. Well, it's interesting that the cells keep producing this junk that doesn't do anything. 
Well, and that's a really good point because the thing is, is that I'm thinking, shouldn't we have already gotten rid of this by yeah, now? Natural seen, selection would right, take right. Care natural of it. selection, use it or lose it. Why mm -hmm. do we still have it? And their answer, of course, is what it always is: just give it enough time. Mm -hmm. You know, time's always the key. And time can, you know, cover a lot of things mm -hmm. uh, because you'll never be able to observe it, so you'll never know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not true. So there was a study done several years ago. Um, and still is ongoing, um, called ENCODE, which stands for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. Okay, so that's where they get the ENCODE from, E-N-C-O-D-E. Uh -huh. um, so phase one was completed in 2007 and published, they published dozens of papers in scientific journals. This is like researchers from all over the world, okay, that are basically collaborating on studying the junk DNA. And um, so what they did was, like I said, involves a lot of scientists and research facilities around the world. They studied 1% of the human genome, the stuff that's supposedly junk. And what they found, much to their surprise, is that nearly all of it is transcribed in RNA. Now, that was surprising, because remember what I said before, we go from DNA to RNA to oops, proteins. To proteins, uh -huh. right? So if it's not going to proteins, why is it made in RNA? Hmm. It didn't make any sense to them. Well, it has a function as RNA. This is functional too, right? Hmm. Not just this, but this is functional. Hmm. And so that's what they were finding out. And so some of the people, some of the quotes from this I always found interesting. Uh, Dr. Francis Collins, who was at the time was the head of the National um, Genome Research in Institute said, there's a lot more going on than we thought. Hmm. And my favorite quote from Eric Green, who was a scientific director there, says, the take home message is, oh my gosh, this is really complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Which might be the understatement of the year. Yeah. And, and you have to understand, this was totally, they did not expect this. I mm. mean, this was totally, again, it's a genetic fossil, right? These are just evolutionary leftovers. Mm -hmm. We don't use them, they're not important. Well, then why are we making them in the RNA? Mm -hmm. I mean, wh again, why would we do that? It seems like we would have gotten waste rid of Waste of that. energy, a it's waste of, yeah, yeah, of the it's cells. A total waste. So it's a problem. Hmm. So then they decided to complete phase two in 2012. So if 1% was important, then we need to study the remaining 99%, right, of the human genome, the rest of the junk, so to speak. And what they found was that at least 80% of it is functional because it has specific biochemical activity. Hmm. And what does it mean? It means something's binding to it. Hmm. It's being expressed in RNA. It's, it's active, right? It's hmm. not just sitting there in the DNA hanging out. It's doing something. Hmm. And um, one of the researchers that was involved in this said it's likely that 80% will go to 100%. Okay. So, so we just know that 80% is doing something. He's saying we're going to probably find out the other 20 right. is too. Right, because this is still ongoing. I mean, yeah. it's 3 billion base pairs, right? It's yeah. a lot of DNA yeah. <laughs> to study and to figure this out. And so it really has been um, amazing research that they've done. And a lot of the functions, again, are believed to be regulatory. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're regulating the other 2%. When, where, why, how, how, how much, under what condition. Mm -hmm. That becomes important. And What's really exciting is they found that some of these variations in the junk, junk DNA are linked to disease. Okay. And people never looked there before, right? Because mm. they said, nope, it's got to be in the other parts, you know, the genes, that's what's really important. No one ever looked in the junk DNA. And this is just some um, papers that have come out about this. Um, junk DNA involved in cancer, type 2 diabetes, schizophrenia, celiac disease, stroke damage. You know, you've got all these different kinds of things where they found mutations in the DNA that they know can link directly to disease. Mm. Uh, so it's important. That tells us something right there. If it's, if it's mutated and it's resulting in type 2 diabetes, it's important. Mm. <laughs> um, it is not junk. And why we really need to find another name for this. Yeah, that was kind of an <laughs> arrogant name. That just, I always put it in quotes. Yeah, yeah, because we don't know what it is, it must be junk. And now we're finding out that we right. were wrong. <laughs> it's important. It's, a lot of its functions, you know, just to name a few, it turns genes off, mm. okay? Because they don't, it shouldn't be on all the time. You okay. need to turn them off. You need to regulate that. You need to fine tune things like transcription and translation that we talked about earlier. Um, you need to regulate genes during embryo formation. That should be different than what you have for an mm. adult. Um, uh, DNA formatting, you've got to wind six feet DNA, of DNA up into the nucleus, right? So you've really got to structure it. You've got to package it, so to speak. Mm. So it's involved in that. 
and um, even in generating some diversity, our immune system has to be able to go against a lot of foreign invaders, so it may have a role in there. In some mouse studies, they've actually been able to delete parts of the junk DNA, and guess what? They don't make it. They don't oh, survive. Wow. They don't, it's lethal, or they have a lot of problems if they are actually born. So for those mice, it was not junk. It was necessary, and it probably is in us, too. Right, absolutely, hmm. absolutely. So that's, so that's the problem with that. So in summary, junk DNA is functional. It is important. A lot of it's involved in regulation, and it may account for a lot of the differences between organisms because from a gene perspective, it, you know, if you're looking at different mammals, our genes are probably going to be the same or similar because we have to do similar things. But the regulation of those things is probably very different between organisms. So that's where we're going to find a lot of the differences. Well, Dr. Purdom, let's hold that thought right there. We need to take a break. Come back with us. We're looking at design in DNA. Stay with us after this message. Welcome back to Origins. We're talking to Dr. Georgia Purdom, who's been sharing some fascinating things about human DNA. We've been looking at design in DNA, but there's another kind of design. Can you tell us about that? Right, so we've been talking about sequence design, but now we're gonna talk about structural design. And that really deals with sort of the three-dimensional shape of um, DNA. It's not just a linear sequence of bases. Mm -hmm. and how different things modify that structure and how that changes how the DNA is actually expressed. We've been talking about going to RNA and proteins, how that um, really does affect that. And so we're gonna focus in um, on this particular area on an area called epigenetics. Ah, okay, so there's okay. a new word for you. Yes. So epi means over, outside mm -hmm. of, around. So this is um, basically chemical markers or chemicals and that um, basically alter the expression of the genes. And when we say expression, we mean, again, going from RNA to proteins, okay? okay. So this is going to affect the expression of um, those genes. Okay. And uh, so just to show you kind of on a diagram here, so DNA is wound around uh, these yellow things here called histones, they're okay. proteins. Because remember, we gotta put six feet in every cell. Yes. Okay, so it's gotta be highly packaged. Hmm. But then there's these little colored dots here, which are representing modifications to the DNA. They're chemicals that modify whether the DNA is wound up tightly, so it can't be expressed, so you can't go to RNA and proteins, or whether it's loose and it's unwound and okay. can go to RNA and can go um, to the protein. So that's really what these chemical modifiers, so to speak, do. There's about 12 different ones in um, human beings. Okay. And so they're very, very important um, because they are heritable. Okay, so you don't just inherit the sequence of DNA, you also inherit the markers, the chemical markers on the DNA. No one thought this happened for years. They just hmm. thought once the egg and sperm unite, all those markers fall off. They oh. don't fall off. Okay. Some of them stay on. Hmm. And so you inherit it. Now what's interesting is wh where do these markers come from, these, hmm. these chemicals? How do they... In other words, what's causing them to be on the DNA? They're actually environmentally controlled. So things like diet and stress can either cause them to be added or cause them to be taken off the DNA so that it changes the expression actually of um, the DNA. So um, you've heard the expression, you are what you eat. Mm -hmm. Well, you're also what your mother and grandmother ate. Now, it's not mm. that they actually ate you. Whenever I say that, I think people are not going to understand what I'm saying. But what, say, your mother ate or even what your grandmother ate while she was pregnant with your mom wow. can affect your DNA. Mm. Okay? Not the sequence of the DNA, mm. but how the DNA is expressed, how those chemicals okay. are on the DNA. Mm. And one of the things that I like to do to help people understand this better is to use um, an analogy in, English, in the English language. So I'm gonna show you two sentences, right? And they have the same exact words in the sentence. The only thing that's different is the punctuation. Mm. And we're gonna see how that changes the meaning of those words. So um, a woman without her man is nothing. Uh-oh, okay? Not, we're gonna get in trouble with that one. <laughs> now this one, a woman without her man is nothing. Wow. Okay, mm -hmm. so I was saying choose whatever sentence you like, but. <laughs> 
the only thing that's different between those two sentences is punctuation. Mm -hmm. And um, so same words, but same letters, but totally different meaning because you have different punctuation. Mm. That's kind of how epigenetics works, wow. right? You have the same sequence, you have the same basis same of DNA. Same basic information right, there. Okay. But you get different expression of it based on the punctuation or the chemical modifiers on. That's very um, helpful. So I'm gonna show you a short video that I think it's a little funny, but also helps, I think, really explain this area of epigenetics really well. Great. The sweet smell of fruit doesn't normally send rats running. But when researchers paired the orange cherry almondy scent of the chemical acetophenone with a painful electric shock, lab rats quickly learned to fear it. Along the way, extra neurons sprouted in their noses and in the smell processing center of their brains, making them super sensitive to the scent. This result isn't shocking. What is surprising is that the rat's pups and their pups' pups were also startled by the smell of acetophenone and had the same extra neurons as their fathers, despite never having been introduced to either their dad's or the fruity scent before. But how could the pups have inherited something that their fathers learned? Basic genetics tells us that only DNA gets passed along to offspring. Characteristics like memories, scars, or giant muscles can't get passed on since acquiring them doesn't alter the genetic code. But it turns out that instilling fear in the rats did trigger genetic changes, not in the DNA sequence itself, but instead in how that code was read and used in the rats' bodies. In every cell, biological machinery constantly translates DNA into the proteins needed to carry out vital processes. Chemical switches attached to the DNA turn genes on or off or up and down, telling the machinery which proteins to produce and in what quantities. These switches, called epigenetic tags, are why a kidney cell looks and acts differently than a skin or nerve cell, even though all three cells have identical DNA. But the switches in any one cell aren't set in stone. Teaching those rats to fear the fruity smell switched one of their smell sensing genes into overdrive. Researchers don't know all the places in the rat's bodies where this switch got flipped, but they know it happened in one key set of cells, the rat's sperm cells, which would one day pass along the tweaked genetic material, making the next generation of rats super sensitive to acetophenone. Rodents aren't the only creatures demonstrating this weird type of inheritance. In Ivakalik, Sweden, boys who suffered through tough winter famines went on to have super healthy sons with extremely low rates of heart disease and diabetes. And their son's sons had the same excellent health, living an unbelievable 32 years longer on average than the grandsons of boys who hadn't gone hungry. To be clear, this does not mean that we should start starving our kids for the benefit of future generations. Scientists don't even know yet exactly which switches the Swedish famines flipped. While we have been able to connect specific epigenetic changes to health effects in mice, we're a long way off from being able to make those connections in humans. That may sound like a bummer, but it's mostly because we humans don't live in the well-controlled environment of a laboratory. And for that, we should be grateful. So what we can see from that video, which is a little humorous, um, but it really teaches a lot about epigenetics and that the environment, the diet, stress, all of those things can greatly affect our DNA and that information can be passed on. Mm. So epigenetics is very, very real. Mm. And what I really like about it, you know, in summary, just is that it allows organisms to change quickly and easily mm. in relationship to their environment. And I think that's important. You know, we live in a fallen world. We've got to be able to adapt and change. And it's much easier to do that than actually change the sequence of the DNA. Mm. Because that's, that's a more long-term thing. It's going to be harder to change it back. This is temporary. Um, it can be changed back if the environment changes. But you've mm. got some immediate benefits for the offspring that then you can pass on, which might be good in that environment, mm -hmm. but it doesn't actually change the sequence of the DNA. Because mutations are usually bad things, mm. and you don't want to do that. You just want to change the expression, so to speak. But that seems like an amazing blessing that God has put mm -hmm. into creatures, that right. this kind of a thing can really benefit. And uh, like you said, it's not some kind of a permanent mutation. Right. It's uh, an experience that, you know, your ancestor goes through mm -hmm. that you actually benefit from. Right, exactly. Mm. And so, and that's what we need to see. So when we look at this, I mean, there's no way this could have evolved. Mm. This is clearly designed. It is not disorder. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I think about that, too, I think about the passage in Romans 1.20. You know, God says he can be known through what he has made. Mm. You know, it's clear. The evidence is absolutely mm. clear. There's that people, they're without excuse. Mm. God can be known through what 
um, he has created. So then why do people, if the evidence is clear, if it's staring them in the face, mm -hmm. why do they continue not to believe? Because we also know Romans 1.18 mm -hmm. says that people suppress the truth and unrighteousness. It's a heart issue mm -hmm. is what it boils down mm -hmm. to. And so, but we need to keep showing people the evidence, showing them these yes. kinds of things um, and showing them how, hey, this is absolutely consistent with um, truth based on God's word, that he has designed this, that mm. he has created this, and absolutely inconsistent that any of this could have come about by random chance over eons of time. What the Bible says is true, that God really is and has created all things. Well, I wish you all the best of luck, uh, George. I wish everyone at Answers in Genesis Thank the best you. of, really, I should say, God's blessing, uh -huh. that uh, you'll continue to do what you're doing and that the Lord will continue to use you in Thank a powerful you. way. Well, I want to thank all of you for being with us. Uh, as we saw today, DNA is the building blocks of life. We all have over 3 billion base pairs in every cell. Evolutionists say that all of that stuff is random and the regulation of it is random. And, you know, the evidence shows that, it, that it's just not the case, that it had to have had a designer. It just goes to show you once again that we know what the Bible says is true and the proof, well, it's all around you. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Origins, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling. And write to Origins Program, number 1805, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.